Okay, so I know this is a little bit unexpected because I normally do things in a compilation format, but I gotta be honest, I just don't have enough right now to do either the worst tank concepts of World War II or a worst tank concepts of the Cold War yet. So, in order to fill in the upload gap, I figured I would just do a short little analysis of a, um, uh, interesting Cold War vehicle. Anyway, enough of my rambling, let's get right into the video. It's late 1945, and the Second World War is officially over. The bloodiest conflict in human history has finally come to an end after six bloody years. Most people thought that now a time of peace would begin, a time of rebuilding and healing. But it never happened. Instead, we enter a new type of war called the Cold War. And oh boy, what a way to start the Cold War than with the Victory Parade on September 7th, 1945. To sum the parade up, it was basically just the Soviets saying, ha ha, take the L, Germany. But the US took a much different message from that because of one certain pancake turret heavy tank, that being the Joseph Stalin III, or IS-3, which basically sent the entire War Department into a frenzy. Almost immediately, projects are being drawn up for a tank to counter this new Soviet heavy tank. This wonder weapon, apparently. And one of the most interesting designs submitted for this was a design by the Chrysler Corporation called the Chrysler K. Now, the proposal for the Chrysler K was officially submitted to the Armored School at Fort Knox on May 14th, 1946. The vehicle was designed to carry the new 105mm T5E1 from the T29 and T95 heavy tanks. Now, almost immediately in the design phase, a problem cropped up, which was the length of the barrel. Which, the barrel was quite long, it would likely end up colliding with pretty much anything even vaguely close to the vehicle. So Chrysler came up with a very interesting solution, which was to move the turret to the rear of the vehicle. Now, this turret had one big thing with it, and that's how big it was. The turret was supposed to have an internal diameter of almost 10 feet, and an almost 7 foot turret ring diameter which was in order to accommodate the 105mm gun's long breach, as well as 100 105mm shells, as well as the entire crew. But we will get back to that later. Now, secondary armament for the vehicle consisted of 350 caliber machine guns and 230 caliber machine guns. 150 caliber machine gun was to be mounted coaxially next to the main gun, while the other two were fitted in remote-controlled turrets at the rear of the hull at the flanks of the turret, which were to serve as the vehicle's defense from air attack. Now, there is one thing kind of odd regarding those 230 caliber machine guns that I mentioned earlier, which is that it's unknown if those were in a fixed position or if they were in a remote-controlled arrangement like the rear turrets. It's very safe to assume that they would be remote-controlled like the 50 caliber machine guns, because fixed machine guns had been phased out pretty much almost as soon as we entered World War II. Now, as I mentioned earlier about the whole crew being in the turret, apparently Chrysler's idea with that was that it was supposed to improve communication between the crew as well as increase cooperation. Now, due to the entire crew being in the turret, including the driver, the driver was to be in a rotating seat, which was always facing towards the front of the vehicle no matter which way the turret was facing. Now, this vehicle had one enormous technical hurdle to overcome, which was that the U.S. Ordnance Department had required that vehicles of its type had to achieve a 20 horsepower per ton ratio, which meant that the vehicle would have to be powered by a 1,200 horsepower engine, as the vehicle was predicted to weigh 60 tons. In order to accommodate this enormous engine that it would have required, the engine had to be placed ahead of the turret, and the engine would have powered two electric motors which would have formed the vehicle's final drives. The vehicle was also projected to carry 600 gallons of fuel, however it's unknown how many fuel tanks it would have required to achieve this amount. Now, so far, the design doesn't sound too horrible from what we can tell, but here's where we actually go in depth and find out that it's not as great as it may seem. For one, 
The turret was originally planned to store the ammunition around the inner perimeter of it, which apparently, according to the engineers, would be physically impossible to do, as the gun and the crew would leave no space for the ammunition. And unfortunately, they didn't bother to write down where the shells were going to be moved to. However, they would likely be moved into the lower hull, which probably would not equal a very good reload time. Armor on this vehicle is particularly un-American, as the frontal armor was to be 7 inches on the turret face and hull face, however the sides were only 3 inches thick, and the hull sides in particular were really egregious, as they only had a 20 degree inward slope, which would only accentuate this lack of armor. By housing the driver in the turret as well, Steering the vehicle would be incredibly difficult and would require an incredibly complex system to achieve even the bare minimum of effective steering, which, if you look at Object 416, for example, you can see all of the problems with having the driver in the turret. The rear turret configuration also would hamper gun depression. It's also pretty safe to assume that even with the turret being as wide as it is, by having the entire crew in the turret, along with that enormous gun, crew conditions inside the turret would not have been optimal, and it likely would have been a very unergonomic and very uncomfortable environment to be in. And here's an issue that pretty much nobody ever brings up. The remote-controlled machine guns are all well out of reach of the crew, meaning that once they've fired their whatever quantity of ammunition, they're out of ammunition, and they cannot be reloaded until after the battle you are in is over. The funny thing is, is it does not seem to be the problems with the design that actually led to this project being cancelled. This project was actually cancelled due to a lack of funding and interest, and the big thing that took the interest away from a vehicle like the Chrysler K was the T-43 heavy tank, which proved to be a much better investment than the Chrysler K ever would be. As for the Chrysler K program, pretty much almost nothing ever amounted from it. The only things that really ever came out of it were some line drawings and a wooden mock-up, and no functional physical prototype was ever completed. Oh, oh dearie me, that was, that was a thing. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this little shorter video that was sorta more in-depth. Can't really go too in-depth into a vehicle that basically only has like six paragraphs of information on it, but oh well. We did it anyway. Well, either way, I hope the video was entertaining enough, and hopefully here soon, I will have the next compilation video for y'all, which will either be the worst tank concepts of World War II Volume 4, or potentially the worst tank concepts of the Cold War, which, oh my, the early Cold War is something. Anyway, I hope y'all have uh, enjoyed this, and I am now going to go and... I don't know, eat a cheeseburger or something. America. Anyway, bye, I guess. <laughs>